David Glassberg from the History Department and Public History Program. And we're really lucky uh, that one of the artists in the Du Bois in Our Time uh, exhibition, uh, Jefferson Pinder, and you can see the exhibit uh, in the University Museum of Contemporary Art, which is downstairs in the Fine Arts Center. It will be there um, through the first week of December. Um, anyway, so one of those 10 artists is actually here and can talk a little bit about his background and uh, the kind of work that he does. And why I thought this was really appropriate for the history department is in looking over a lot of the things that uh, Jefferson Pinder has done, it, they really involved using historical materials one way or another. And the public history program has always been interested in this question of sort of how artists use history. And so I thought that would be really an interesting thing to hear more about um, for him. Uh, his background is really unusual in the sense that he got his bachelor's degree um, in theater um, from the University of Maryland. Um, and then after doing a bunch of other stuff, uh, got a master's in fine arts in painting and mixed media, also from the University of Maryland, about 10 years later. So the work that he does, as you'll see, kind of bridges a lot of what you might say is fine art, video, uh, a variety of things. And I, I don't even want to try to um, put it in a pigeonhole because I don't think it deserves to be in one. Um, and just a variety of awards and you know exhibitions at the Corcoran and a lot of really um, famous uh, <coughs> and prominent places. Uh, so we're really, as I say, lucky to have him here. He's now teaching in Chicago at the School of the Art Institute. So with that, I'll just thank you. Thank you. Feel free to raise your hand if, if you see something, because we might um, go off on a tangent that, that will be 10 times more interesting just me talking at you. I, th I think it's really important that, um, uh, that everybody kind of share a little bit into this experience, because um, we're going to be touching on a lot of points. I'm going to try to hit them kind of quickly, and some stuff uh, probably, you know, would be really nice to hear from from this audience. So, if um, if you're so inclined, please don't and let's not be precious here. It's not an academic talk. Rather, I'm sharing my artwork with you, and I'm talking about how my artwork relates to, to history. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, this has like just been really wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, coming from Chicago, the, uh, all pun intended, this has been a breath of fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> it's not every day, and I say that a lot because when I first started showing, I would I had these marvelous exhibitions in, in Poland and Warsaw, and I was thinking this will happen every year. Um, but now I, I know that you know, good things come sometimes. You know, it, and and you know, in the most unexpected um, moments, and this was very unexpected. Uh, I would like to thank Loretta Yarlow and Ava first, and and um, for being like incredible curators first and foremost. Um, something else I've learned over time is that to get to to work with great curators is 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 few and far between. I mean, they have to be sensitive. They have to really care about the work. And um, my experience here uh, has been wonderful, and and they're very nurturing. Um, and, and that's what we need. That's what artists need. We need that environment, but we also need people to say, we believe in you. We be I was talking to uh, Eva yesterday, and she was saying, you know, we're, do we're taking on this, this um, commission, and it's like a huge leap of faith. They had no idea what was going to be in this space. Um, Loretta's like, how's everything going? Okay, good, good, you know. <laughs> meanwhile, I'm, I'm running around frantically trying to make things happen. But they had ultimate faith that things would, and, and I think that's, that's extremely rare. So I'd like to thank them. They're top-notch, top-notch curators. Thank you. I'd also like to thank um, David Glassberg. Uh, we had this, this wonderful conversation last year, and, and we were sitting at the table, and I'm thinking, I, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And he started talking to me about pageants. And, <laughs> and, and I, I, I thought, well, this sounds interesting. And he's like, do you know Du Bois had you know, 300 people on stage singing O Freedom. I'm like, whoa. You know, and so I started doing research and I'd call him up and I would ask him only the kind of questions that an artist would ask an academic historian. And, and he was so patient and wonderful with me, so I'd like to thank David uh, for that, for that mentorship. Thank you very much. Um, see, now I'm getting Southern. Right? <laughs> We've been going on for like 20, 30 minutes. But, um, 
One other uh, thank you, and it's a combined thank you. Um, Craig Albin, who's not here, and, and Francisco right here, um, were with me on Labor Day weekend. When, when, people, when everybody else is barbecuing, they took time out of their schedule to make sure that all the glitches were out of the system so that the, the show could run the way it should be. And, and, and man, working in a lot of different institutions, it's, it's not often that you run into people who care as much about the work. Usually, sometimes you work with people behind the scene and they're like, okay, whatever, give it to me, we'll put it in. It's not ready, okay, we're gonna be in, the, in this office and tell me when it's done. But these guys are like, what can we do? It's like, this isn't working, let's try this, you can try this. I'm like, oh, I have a new version of the piece, Francisco's like, I'll put it in. So, Francisco, thanks a lot. All right. Um, so, my work um, is about history, and then I start thinking about it. And you know, it's one of those problems that you start thinking about, okay, uh, how does my work relate to history? And then I start looking at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, it, it relates a lot more than I even thought. Um, I think just by its nature, my, my, uh, my mentor at the University of Maryland would, would always say, you know, you have to understand the continuum of, of black art or art and figure out where you fit into this continuum. D Dr. David Driscoll, um, his incredible mentor, uh, he, you know, sometimes would, would just uh, talk to me about, it seems like, the, the most uh, uh, the, the strangest, uh, abstract, uh, you know, personal things. Uh, but but I, I learned over time that it's like those, those conversations is really what, what kind of sparked my, my imagination. Um, David Driscoll, if, if you don't know, is the, the, not only the curator for the, the Cosby Collection, and not only is he an, an eminent scholar, but he received um, the Medal of Humanities from, from President Clinton in 1992. Um, I was lucky to work with him. I, I was telling a story uh, last night that I didn't realize when he was my professor at the University of Maryland, I had no idea who he was. I mean, I understood that he was bright, he was intelligent, he was a great professor, but I didn't bother to, to do the research that like many students you know, should about who's teaching them. Until after I finished school, I was doing social work in Seattle, and I was hearing his name again and again and again, and I was like, I had a class with this guy, and I barely knew who he was. So when I, went, when I moved back to Maryland, uh, one of the interesting things that happened is I, I went to his, um, his studio and I said, Dr. Driscoll, if there's anything that you need, let me know if I can do, you know, if I can cut your grass, I can, you know. And, and he said, actually, I'm going to be doing some yard work next week. <laughs> and you know, it, and it took a while for me to understand that, that he's a master gardener. And that's where he put me, he put me in his garden. And, and that was just an incredible, wondering, uh, wonderful, and nurturing um, experience and uh, he his 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 message was like you know it's, it's not enough to just to make work you have to make work and understand what has come before you and that's that's not just a you know African American um, art paradigm it's it's really it's it's the message to all artists it's what I teach my students at the SAIC it's it's like you have to understand you know um, how to fit into this this system, and I, I think it's a it's a message for academia in general. I mean, you, you're trying to, to bring new information to the forefront, and um, working with him was is excellent. I, I had no idea living in D.C. that um, that you had to get up to and, and move to the back of the bus when the, when the um, bus moved from Washington D.C. into Virginia, and back in Jim Crow, and and you know, and to, to be able to talk to somebody who who actually had to move. From one location to the other is, is, is I mean, it was a treasure. Because you, you you take things for granted that the way things are is the way they had been. But um, sometimes, I mean, I think you need somebody to say no that this is the way it was, and you know, it was really screwed up. So that that's that's some of my background. Um, as David mentioned, um, I study theater. The problem is I, I didn't know how I fit into that world. I, I didn't like the audition. Um, it was just like <laughs> kind of deaths for, for an actor if you don't want to audition. <laughs> then it became my own performance piece when I did what I, you know, what I wanted to do instead of what I thought they wanted to see. And I realized this probably isn't going to work. Um, they actually, uh, back in the 90s when I was in school, they, they, they separated the theater programs where they had the Project or X which was like the experimental pieces, like the Emory Baraka pieces. And then you had your main stage productions. Um, which was maybe Moliere, or, or you know, it could be a little shop in the a little shop of horrors, or something like that. But it was like, I mean, it was separate. It was separate, and it wasn't equal. I mean, the, um, the generation that, or you know, Project X, um, 
uh, program happened in a black box. Um, you know, the main stage productions, uh, you know, where the comedies of manners and, and, and what have you. And, and you know what? It was like an odd thing to, to, to feel that kind of segregation uh, and try to have to negotiate that. Um, so I gravitated uh, to probably the more um, interesting people in the department rather than the main stage productions. And I, I ran into um, this one theater producer, and his name was Jacob Derzik. And he's from Serbia, and he kind of changed the way I, I saw, like, movement and um, physicality. This is biomechan uh, biomechanic uh, posed by Nikolai Kusta, and what he's doing is he's um, he's using his body uh, and putting his body in, in, a, in a pose to evoke an emotional response, which I, you know I, I thought was just fascinating. And, and doing a, a production um, in this style was completely different than anything I've done before. Um, Vesvold Meyerhold uh, cre created this technique of biomechanics, and biomechanics was you know motivating yourself physically to to be able to convey the things that Stanislavski was was using like psychologically. So what you would do is instead of you know thinking about your grandmother or, or a sibling who who you know uh, who you miss or had passed away, he would have you do something physical. Like he would have you go around this building 30 times and then do that Hamlet monologue. And then you, you, you're physically, you, you'd be giving an honest reaction because you wouldn't have to think because your body would be in an emotion, I mean, in a state where you're already emotionally stressed just from, from doing that action. So it was kind of like a, a, a different approach to learning theater. And, and this affected me um, uh, enormously. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is talk, talk to you a little bit about um, my early performance video work and then move a little bit more into um, <laughs> kind of uh, more my history pieces, if you will. Uh, but I started out uh, doing like these quick frenetic uh, pieces, like Marathon in 2003, which was in my thesis show, which was about a, a, just a long run, uh, just a continuous run, um, starting in a rural environment and ending in, in the urban environment, starting with nothing and then um, um, ending up in, in an urban environment um, completely uh, exhausted to, to a point of, of collapse with a, with a suit on. Um, this kind of led to, to other ideas, uh, in, in which I um, entitled the Inertia Series. Um, but what I loved was this idea of um, athleticism you know, equals heroics. And with that, and using that path, understanding a little bit more about um, identity. Uh, so most of my work deals with physicality. Uh, in particular, uh, the effort that it takes to move forward. Uh, this piece, Mule, uh, from, I think you can't see it, but 2005, I'm pulling a 300-pound log uh, through the city of Baltimore. I mean, some of you might be able to recognize that this very distinctive architecture here. Uh, but you're working yourself to collapse, because a collapse, it, it, that's truthful, that's honest. And, and that's what I wanted to convey, is this idea of like working yourself until th there was nothing left, spending yourself. Um, so in, in the elements of, of you know, performance art, I mean, there was a lot of people who were doing similar things. Um, I wasn't alone. But you know, sh sharing it to, to the you know to a, to a different crowd, this this might seem absurd. Uh, which I respond by by saying that there's a lot of people in Baltimore who are watching me doing it who really understood why I was doing it. And I think that's what was was incredible and was um, very rewarding is is people would would stop me and say, "What are you doing?" And I'm saying, "I'm pulling this," and they're like, "Why are you pulling it?" And it's like I'm doing doing it because I'm I'm pulling this heavy weight because I think it's symbolic of an, of an effort, a particular kind of intensity. And they'd say, go ahead and pull it then. Pull it, you know? Um, and I like that. Did yeah, anybody yeah. offer to help? Actually, uh, my one, uh, one piece type of processional, somebody did. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was kind of a, a really just a wonderful moment. This guy um, actually was with a, another pole like this. It was encrusted with, with tin. What you see is like ceiling tin from the innards of um, these houses. Um, so it's like ceiling and wall tin, and then I, I made this object, and I pulled it. And then, yeah, people on the street, uh, one guy on the street's like, can I help you with it? And um, it was just so ironic, because that was the processional piece, and you know, growing up in a Catholic household, I was like, oh, this is, this is trippy. Um, <laughs> it's like, sorry. But, um, so this evolved into other, other performance. Is there a way to turn off maybe some of the lights here? Yeah. Oh, there we go. So, we'll, um, so how does this manifest itself um, in different ways? Uh, spinning was uh, 
a performance in which I'm on an, uh, an exercise bike and I'm going nowhere. I mean, that's, that's the trademark of this inertia cycle is there's all this effort, but you end up pretty much in the same place where you start. Um, so this was like a mystical journey, a uh, middle passage journey. It started with, with footage behind me being projected from, um, from Africa, from Senegal, and it ended up in the streets of Baltimore. Um, without going a supersonic journey, without going anywhere, just being static. What kind of mask are you wearing? This, um, it's a Dan mask. It's like um, it's from from West Africa, and I got it when I when I traveled there. Um, it has a, a fin right on the top, and it's it's just a very unique mask. Um, I mean, it's not uh, authentic, but <laughs> I think uh, you know, it, it, to me, it, it would work as just a marvelous prop. Well, you know what? I shouldn't even say that because it's authentic now. I think that's what's great about it is like you know when you do this ritual, you're you're giving this this meaning to this object, even though it was something I picked up as a, you know, almost like a tourist item. Um, then when I when I uh, perform with it, it becomes something else. Uh, this is Lazarus, and this was inspired by watching uh, people come together to push and move an object like a car or something that's supposed to move people. Um, this huddled mass of, of individuals moving this vehicle forward. Uh, to me, there was something uh, poetic and heroic when you see a car stalled and then you know, people just stop what they're doing, get out their cars and they start moving. You know, it's like it, without, without cue, they, they, they see the action and they respond to it. So this performance piece, Lazarus was, was this the car that, that could move. Um, and then gradually um, a huddled mass of people came in. Some people who I recruited, other people who, who jumped in off the street to move this car. Um, so it's like united together for one goal. And at the bottom is, is my old gunny from when I was in the Marine Corps. He uh, was stationed at 8th and I. And he was the first person to help me. Um, and then from that, it was just like a, a, a group of individuals who were you know, making this, this <coughs> object which seems like it, it could never move, like uh, go from one place to another. Invisible Man, um, you know, penned in, in 1947, uh, Ralph Ellison talks about 1,369 lights. That, um, that the protagonist uh, steals from the monopolated light company. And this dark, damp basement, you know, he uses the light to, to illuminate himself and to, to illuminate his reality. So um, in this performance piece, it starts off in complete darkness. And one at a time, we acquired 1,369 lights in my um, ex-wife's house. <laughs> we were friends. And, um, and <laughs> you know, after we wired them, we had it up for a little while. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could get all these other people to come in and stand under the light, and she's like, no, take it down. Um, and so, but, but, I, but what was, was wonderful uh, about this is, is that um, as each light came on, my digital camera couldn't handle the, the brightness. And I started to, to, to fizz away, I, I, I kind of dissolved into this whiteness. Um, so it's a process of um, lighting these th things up individually that, that just kind of blows me out and then, and then then going back in reverse to, to, to dark darkness, so it's just like one continuous loop. Um, I think everybody, you know, a lot of African American artists I know um, have done a piece um, at one point or another about Invisible Man. I, I think it's it's just that important of, of a novel. I mean, historically, I mean, I think that it has all this power, and, and the metaphors that he uses are just so colorful and beautiful that it just like it, it screams out to you to. to to either to interact with it. And, and I guess that's where I want to go to when I um, talk about kind of moving into history is this idea of interaction. What this allows me, what this performance work allows me to do is, is interact with history, is, is to intervene um, to some degree and, and to highlight things that might not normally, um, you know, you, you might read in a book and, and you, you might study it, but, but, but performing it in some way or, or in, in some um, aspect being able to, to revisit it, um, to make it come alive, is, is, is a truly invigorating experience. Um, and, and that's why I do what I do. Because then somehow, you know, you hear about all these, these things that are happening in, in the news, you, you, you read about them in books. I, want, I guess I go and I want, I want to reenact them. And somehow I, I want to, to have some uh, meaningful connection with, with the past. Um, so, as we were talking a little earlier about, um, commissions are difficult. Uh, not too long after grad school, about five years after grad school, a curator came into my studio and he's like, I got this idea for a show. 
It's called the After 1968 Show. And we want to do it at the High Museum. It was, at the time, one of my first uh, museum exhibitions. And he said, we want you to do a piece about the African American experience since 1968. So, um, you know, being young and enthusiastic, um, I was like, you want me to do, do a creative piece about, you know, blackness, you know, after 1968, and I was born in 1970. He's like, yes. Wow. Um, and, and I guess, you know, when, when we talk to your class day a little later um, tomorrow about, you know, the criteria of Negro art, it, it's like, that is like, it's a gift on one hand. It's like, you go to a young artist and you say, we're going to show you in a museum, but we want you to do something about something that, that is so large, you know, it's like, you know, Francisco, I want you to do something about, you know, the, you know, the Latin American, Latin American experience since, you know, 1952. It's like, well, where the hell do you begin with that? It's like a, it's like a gift and it's a double-edged sword and, and also just, it's a little bit of poison. Um, so what you do is you, you do the best you can. You know, and I was thinking, well, I could do anything. And that could be about the African American experience. Just the fact that my presence in this museum in 2008 is, uh, it, it, you know, you know, tells you a lot about what has happened and the legacy of the civil rights movement. So, as artists, we're trained to when we when you we set a problem in front of you, um, us, or when a problem is set in front of us, uh, we subvert. Um, and I think that's where I began. I began like, okay, if you want me to do a piece about the experience um, of blackness since the civil rights, let's you know, let's talk about all the things that that might not have changed. Um, and this is passive resistance. This is my partner in crime, uh, Matt Ravenstall, and uh, myself, and we're, we're creating a piece in which we're demonstrating non-violent um, resistance. Because the one thing that I, I learned when I was going through all the files at the High Museum, and they had incredible photographs, is that you were constantly watching people being beat. But it's the most heroic thing that, that they, you know, they do is to be able to endure a blow <coughs> and, and to not throw one back. And, and the more I researched, the more I understood that this is, I mean, these people were of the, you know, the highest <coughs> heroics. You know, they would sit at a lunch counter, sometimes you know, being pulled by their hair, um, being, uh, you know, hot soup being thrown on them, coffee being poured on them, and they, and they didn't throw a punch back. So that, to me, that was just like, let's talk about heroics and that, 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 you know, being able to train yourself to do that was, was really cool. Is the hot you seen in Atlanta? It is. That's what I thought, okay. No, that's important. Um, because it was, all, it was about the civil rights history um, and legacy. Um, and so I created this piece in which um, Matthew stood in front of me and he dealt blows, open-handed blows, continuously, one after the other. And, and I took it. What I thought was that, that I could convey a certain amount of strength. And we had these cues where we were communicating with each other where at some point I was going to win. But we didn't know where that point was. Um, either that, or I was going to tell him to stop. But but he could, but I wasn't going to tell him. You know, that it, like within this context of this piece, I couldn't just say, "Okay, stop." It had to be almost like these um, this nonverbal communication that when he when he was tired of doing what he was doing, he would stop doing it. And so we had these pieces that we we, um, uh, we created, and we created probably like six or seven video pieces. Um, and meanwhile, our kids were playing in the backyard. Uh, we went in the basement, and I endured blows. And, and to this day, when I show this piece, somebody gets angry. You know, somebody gets upset because they, they're watching me take blows, and they're like, "Why don't you? Why didn't you throw? Why didn't you throw a smack back?" It's like, "Yeah, that's really what you want to see, but that, that's not what happened. That's not how these people were trained. That was rule number one. If you threw a blow back, that's just going to incite them to to want to throw harder blows." You're going to give them reason to really want to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, you know, and he studied um, Bruce, Har um, um, Bruce Hartford. Uh, he actually wrote down in 2004 all the tenets of, you know, um, nonviolent uh, training, how you train um, a combatant uh, to really defend himself without throwing a punch. And uh, to me, this was like a, a manifesto of strength. Um, I mean, what he was saying is um, it was very, uh, it was kind of a, a serious physical experimentation that, that we were undergoing in which um, we had to engage each other. It was almost like a theater exercise, and we were dealing with motivation. Um, and at some point, uh, it, it, it had to come to an end. 
um, and our performance, and usually it was about six or seven minutes, routinely. Uh, so we were studying these photographs, and these are, are um, SLCC um, uh, volunteers who were training themselves to sit at lunch counters in 1963. So these are stills um, from the piece, Past Resistance. Uh, Matt is a good friend of mine. Um, it, was, it was still really hard. It, it was hard because, um, it, I mean, it, it brings up, a, 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 you know, an open-handed smack. I mean, someone could smack you all day, but there's something that's very insulting about it. I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, different than a punch. I mean, that, of course you know it's insulting, but you think, well, would you rather get punched or smacked? Smacking is there's something about an open-handed blow. It's, it's, it's more of, a, of an insult. Um, so, Matthew and I worked at it for, for literally probably like six or seven months, different, different times, uh, usually about five or six takes a day. Um, and I guess I, what I, I mean, we can talk all day about it, but why don't I show you the video?
Thank you. I don't get to show that too often. <laughs> um, it, it seems like you're smirking or or calling him or I don't know. You know, non sort of a the way your mouth is readjusting after a blow. Was that a reaction of the blow or was that part of the performance? No, I think it was a little <coughs> bit of both. You know, I think that um, I think you're dealing with all kinds of craziness when you're thinking about it. You know, I don't. You know, it's like you. I remember Are you first living that in your head as you're doing. Yeah, you know, and, it's, it's, and you're dealing with all the times you've ever been smacked before, too. You know, I think that's what, what I didn't expect. Um, I was in the service for a little while, and I, you know, I, and I got, got smacked around a couple times. And I think it's all these crazy things that were getting, coming into my mind, he became a representation of that. Um, so I think with, with, with this, it was... Um, and he, he was, he was like completely, I mean, I wasn't quite, I could never read, man. I couldn't read if I was winning or when I was. I, I would take the, the footage back um, home and I'd have my, my girlfriend at the time um, look at it and she would say, you can't show this. And I'm like, why not? She's like, you look too weak. And I'm just like, huh. You know, and it's, it's, it's like, it's an interesting balance where, I mean, I, I have probably about, you know, gosh, 20 some takes of this. And this is the one that we used, because some of them I just, I looked like I was really, there wasn't that levity. You know what I mean? I think maybe some, it was like something different when it was smirking. I was like, that, that's something that was, and it was uncontrollable, you know? It was almost like a reset every time. It's like, you know, yeah. You're resetting. Hey, yeah, it's a good it reminds me of Eyes on, the Eyes on the Prize series. Yeah. Currently in the class on TA, we're showing that. And the students, every time they come in discussion, are very, you know, white, black, all this, are like, how did they do that? And yeah. one of them goes, was she smiling? And that reminded me, that's kind of smirk you have. Yeah. Then you see, like, in his eyes, it seems he gets angrier. Yeah. And it reminds me of when you watch Eyes on the Prize and they're pouring hot tea or grabbing. It's almost at the end, it's the resistor is defiant while the person who's perpetrating the violence is so angry that they haven't broken you. And it kind of, I don't know, yeah, I, looking at his, at the end, it kind of looks like he's like, I'm not breaking him. <laughs> like, it just, it, it really just brought me back to just those images of eyes on the prize and the lunch counter and the beatings and all that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think there were moments where, where he had to stop to check on he's like are you all right that, that was that was a hard one and you don't see that i mean i think that's why he's an incredible performer he's like one of um i'd say one of my favorite artists because he's he's a white artist that deals with identity and he's not afraid you know he's not afraid to like to to be you know the, the thing that you despise and hate most because he feels like it, by embodying that in some way he's he, he's revealing a truth so it's like it was a nice combination and, and so i mean i don't think i would would I wouldn't do it with anybody, mm -hmm. but there was something about him that I, I trusted um, deep down, and I knew that we were we saw things the same way. But with, this was his role in the piece, and you know, in mine, yeah. I'm just thinking about the whole idea of like site-specific stuff, like showing this inside of an art gallery in Atlanta has a certain meaning. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it be cool if you got to show this at Monticello? <laughs> yeah, that's a great I mean, it would really cast the whole different. Should write a grant. <laughs> and and there's, I mean, it's it's a context building really that matters a lot. It's kind of interesting. No, I mean, that, I, I completely agree with you. And actually, and I'll get to it in a second. They they didn't show it. Well, I'm just thinking. Also, you talked about um, performance art. I mean, if you you know the driving and having the bystanders in a sense be involved. I mean, can you imagine trying to perform this actually on the street? And, um, what would go down? I mean, right. it's a whole separate thing. But well, well, you know, I was just struck too by kind of the. It struck me as a kind of perf there was. It seemed like whipping, and it was kind. Of, it was the perfunctory nature of of what they were doing also was absolutely you know, no, evocative. Of so you know, many the piece. Things. You remind. I forgot about this. We started the piece um, thinking about reenacting the, the the whipping scene in Roots. 
and um, you know, my name is Kunta Kinte. I mean, yeah. it's, it's interesting that, and it's this. This is like when all the research boils down. You end up with a piece, just like with the Star of Ethiopia. You have like this grand idea, and at the end, you you have like almost like this the essence of, of what it is that you're trying to get at. But yeah, I mean, it's loaded with with all of that. Gosh, that's a good good point. Um, yeah. So, so as I was saying, uh, the High Museum. I, I showed them that, and, and they didn't they didn't respond well. Um, <laughs> you know, and I tell that to my art friends, and they're like, "What do you mean, man? You should have just shoved it down their throats." You know, and and I could have. I mean, I think that, and I think there's a time and place for everything. Um, but usually, a lot of times with these commissions, um, you know, I work on more than one thing at a time. Um, and I was like, okay, well, let me, you know, I, I ended up showing in Virginia, actually, at the Arlington uh, Art Center. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I feel that, you know, that, that, that was our, I mean, this is, a, that was a pretty strong piece. Um, and and I, I had a, a different piece I was working on that I was equally as excited about. So. I, I didn't have any problems uh, changing gears, but even now when I tell my friends that, uh, you know, they have a hard time understanding that it, 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 when you work with a curator, it, it's, it's a collaboration. It really is, um, to a certain degree. And, and it, like in this situation that I was cooking this other piece I was equally as excited about, um, I think it, it, it all worked out just fine. But I thought it was interesting that it, it was almost too much, it was too much for them to handle. Um, so, in my research in 1968, I also learned that um, that was the first time man had been to the dark side of the moon. Um, the Apollo 8 mission, right, they kind of, um, they, you know, was preparing for the, the lunar manning, landing and they ricocheted around, the, um, I guess, the moon and, and, and came, came right back to Earth. And, and there's just some incredible <coughs> footage of propulsion and power. And, and I've always been fascinated with, um, with space exploration. And, you know, you're like, where the hell are you going with this? I have to explain. Um, <laughs> cosmonauts, endless possibilities, optimism. Yuri Gagarin, this is a, a, a painting done of, of him uh, after uh, being the first man to, to reach space. And I just think it's a wonderful, creative, you know, invention. And then I start thinking about, well, the right stuff. Who were the people that had the right stuff? What did they look like? You know, where do I fit into this continuum? <laughs> and, 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 and I, you know, I love this kind of, I love, uh, you know, uh, science fiction, and, and, and I, I like the, the, the genre of, of communication, so I, I wanted to make it a science fiction piece. So I started thinking about all the different things that were happening in the obsession in the 1960s and 70s with, with, with space exploration. And so at the time, I was doing a lot of collage work, and I was looking at, at, at this piece called uh, Rocket to the Moon by Romare Bearden. Um, do you guys see what's going on in the bottom half of the the piece. Can you, can you tell this is not the best image? Uh, can you see what they're doing? The figures? Yeah, they're, they're smoking. Um, which I thought that is just in such an incredible me uh, metaphor. Here you have like a grounded population of people escaping. Um, and at the you know, top of the, the, the painting, you have this, uh, or the collage, you have this, this rocket. And if you've ever been anywhere where um, you didn't want to be and saw an airplane passing by, and how, how many um, you know, thoughts that, that brought to mind. But, but I, I love the composition and how it leads you up. You know, he's kind of bending the, the, the structures, and, and then there's just this, this red circle that's just kind of, kind of, you know, it's kind of blocking any kind of forward, upward momentum. So I, I was looking at this, you know, and at, at the at the top uh, left is Romare Bearden's cat. And I mean, there's all these really personal things that he's putting into this um, this explanation. But in the 70s, probably like a lot of you, I was um, my family religiously watched Star Trek, and I don't know. In, in Washington D.C., they would they would have one episode of Star Trek, and then after that, they would have a Soul Train. It's so it's like this interesting um, dynamic juxtaposition. But it, to me, it represented, the, or actually now when I look at it, it's just this escapism. Um, that there's certain things that can happen uh, beyond the reaches of the Earth's gravitational pull that can't happen anywhere else. Um, and, you know, the first interracial kiss on TV is Star Trek. Well, that was okay. You know? And then when you ask Captain Kirk, well, well, what do you feel? Are we, you know, um, 
William Shatner, what did you feel about like you know being the you know the, you know part of this 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 movement? You know, you know how did you feel like you know uh, giving Lieutenant her that her you know the, the kiss and the, the interracial kiss? Um, and he says, you know, that's my that's what my character would do. <laughs> he said that's that's what he would do, which I thought was just kind of just a bizarrely interesting, honest comment. Um, <laughs> that, that you know in, in these certain places anything can happen. But then I started looking at. Um, other inventors who, who are looking at, at space exploration as, as a, a form of, of escape. And then, uh, as I was mentioning, all this incredible space footage. Um, so I, I created in, in 2008 um, <coughs> Afro Cosmonaut Alien White Noise, which is a piece in which um, it, it was a, a narrative that ends in destruction when the protagonist, myself, um, plummets back to Earth, almost like Icarus, you know, coming um, close to this, this powerful zenith and, 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 and coming crashing back down. Uh, but before the piece begins, I, I, I had to remove um, my blackness. I mean, I, I really saw this as more of a formal choice. Uh, it, it, as, as strong as, as I feel that, that, that the footage is of me removing this, um, you know, removing, painting myself, whitewashing myself, there's something really uh, dynamic that uh, that allows to happen with the, the video footage um, that that wouldn't be able to happen if, if I didn't wipe myself out. So it became about you know slipping myself, inserting myself into this history, allowing these projections to happen um, on me while I'm standing behind the white wall and as a camera's taking shots um, one at a time, about three thousand shots of the whole performance. Uh, Buto inspired actually. Um, I'd been doing a lot of reading about Buto at the time, and I, and I wanted to play with it. You know, I wanted to play with this idea of myself as, as almost like this conduit of this um, movement technique. Um, so I assembled all of these this footage and, and um, had it projected on, on me, and then had like a, a SLR camera, you know, take a series of photographs. Meanwhile, um, the audio track I was I was mixing, um, actual NASA um, you know, communications. Uh, during that mission, I also had uh, Gil Scott Herons, Whitey on the Moon, um, kind of mixed in that little bits and pieces of um, a mountain, the mountaintop speech um, from Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, the ma mountaintop speech um, that, that he gave the, the night or two nights before he was killed. I want to show you that piece. Can I show you that one too?
Yeah, so that's um, Afrocosmonaut. Um, yeah, it, 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 a technique that, that I used, uh, let's see, the, the shadow box already, this is a silent piece. Um, you know, I, it's funny, because when you're doing these commissions, you cast the net really wide. And I, for a while, I mean, I, I was using this Muhammad Ali footage, and I wanted to put myself in this history, and in this place, in this person. Um, and, and trying to, 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 to interact with them. This, this, I usually don't show this, but I thought it would be fun to kind of show you guys today, so I put this in here. <laughs> it's really short. Um, but were there any questions about, about the piece? Um, the music? Well, this is a question about the earlier piece. Okay, uh, sure. So uh, I was just wondering, Jefferson, why you use the term cosmonaut instead of astronaut? Were you, why the Russian term instead of the American? Was there something you wanted to say about alienation, or was it a political statement, um, why you used it instead of... Uh, but you know, it, it's, I had read, and and it stuck with me, that, that you know, the Soviets used the word cosmos as if that there was something attainable there. That the word cosmos has like this, this much broader definition of, of exploration than, than astro. So I, th I thought that was really interesting, that, that there was something tangible to get from outer space and bring back. So, you know, to me that, that term seemed to be fitting for, for you know, the work. And it's subversive, sure. I mean, this whole thing is, I mean, really, the, 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 the piece that I chose was, was titled The Ambush. And that's kind of what I was thinking about as I'm, like, working on my second piece and finishing up for the museum. Um, that, it, as, as I said, the artist's response, a lot of times in these situations, is subversion. Um, so as, as much as, as I, I'm, I was excited and thrilled to be working on this, I, I mean, I also felt like this whole, the whole assignment was, was, was a little bit of an ambush. Um, so, I mean, this is the way that, that, you know, artists appropriately act out. You know, I mean, it, it's like, because you're not going to tell the museum curator when you're, you know, 30 years old, what have you, you know, to hell with you, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm, but, but you do what you want to do, and you give them what they want at the same time. I think that there's, it's, it's, it's a compromise. Um, but, uh, you know, oh, I, I think in this situation, I mean, I, I love this piece, so um, it was the one that I could deal with, but at the same time, it's like a, it's just a negotiation. Uh, how you guys doing? See, I'm, I'm, I'm eyeballing you. I'm checking you out. You don't think I'm noticing. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's like, you know, Professor 101, right? You gotta know when people have had enough, but... Um, I'm going to show you some other stuff, but I can tell that maybe you know the energy is just kind of dying down a little bit. I just mm -hmm. well, if we have to leave, it's because my class is here and we sure. have to do some other stuff. So uh -huh. in case this goes over, just so you know. Um, but I was wondering if you do live performance, and mm -hmm. can you talk about that? You said you started out in theater and performing, and then this stuff does very interesting things with media and interacting. But can you talk about the differences between the two and your choices? Sure. Do one versus the other? Yes. Um, Control, you know, if, when I when I create these video pieces, I have just this enormous control, of, of, you know. Uh, but but when I create my performances, like the Magical Negro, which I did this summer, um, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think there's an element of, of um, you know, it, this this def definite element of, of a spontaneity, and it. There was one scene in, in this, I created this piece called The Magical Negro, which is uh, dealing with the type, you know, the, the stereotype, the magical Negro. Has anybody heard about that? It's the, um, it's the character in movies that, uh, the African-American character whose role is to educate mm -hmm. and to, to, to teach, um, you know, the white protagonist something, but it, it, they have magical powers in many situations, like, like the, um, the Bagger Vance uh, with, or, or like the Green Mile. I will never do that again. <laughs> But I mean, I, but I feel like that, that was brilliant. There was something about. I mean, I hit the target, um, and and I think that you know I, I, I lucked out. I think in another night I might not have. But I think that's the kind of stuff that happens in live performance that that I can't convey in video. Yeah. So I love I love live performance, but I, I think that with my schedule and, and kind of what I'm I, I do a lot less of it. You know, and that's just that's that's unfortunate, but. Uh, but it's it's a great question. I mean, it's something I'm constantly struggling with because you know that we talk. I talk a lot about truth and portraying truth. Well, in that moment, that was that was is truer or truer than anything I've ever made on video. I'm going to cover a few things that um, that I did subsequent, like right after, uh, you know, after Cosmonaut Alien. Uh, you know, Obama 
was elected and, and his inauguration platform was uh, deconstructed and was brought to a salvage yard. And my friend's like, I'm not supposed to tell you this. And this is a great thing about being in DC. This is what I missed up. He's like, I can't tell you this, but guess what came in the big truck today? Obama's inauguration platform. And people are, are picking up this wood and they're building their decks with it. They have no idea. Um, and I, it, it just blew me away. I thought, wasn't there like a special place, like a hangar that they put this kind of stuff? <laughs> and, and what happened is, is um, I, I went and I, um, I, I filled my truck at the time full of dead wood and, and I, I constructed uh, a piece that, that was displayed in 2009 um, called the Capsule, uh, which is a, a, a replication of the, um, of the Mercury capsule with the, with the 24 inch rim at the bottom. <laughs> Um, a big, huge speaker at the top. The whole thing was a speaker, and then that tin, the tin that I love, um, that I used in Mule, and this was hooked into a sound system, um, and it was playing uh, "Living in the City" of Stevie Wonder, and uh, "Space is the Place" for some raw, but just through bass. So there was no. Um, and gosh, uh, you know. I mean, I really love that. I mean, this is one of my favorite pieces. I, I mean, I wish I could make one of these every year. Um, <laughs> oh, you could, Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it now? Um, the Smithsonian uh, um, acquired it. The, the, African, um, the New African American sure. uh, History Museum. Uh -huh. so. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about um, you? You were. Uh, from an artist's perspective, you did a really wonderful job of talking about some of the negotiations that happened between curators and artists in particular. Um, I imagine we have a lot of public history students um, in the room tonight. I wonder if you could talk a little bit, maybe from the other perspective, of what uh, the best experience, some more on the best experiences you've had with curators, and um, if they, you know, how they sort of inspire you to uh, do some of this creative work. I, I didn't understand in school how important curators are in the whole process. Um, it, it's almost, when I say nurturing, I, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. It's just like when I need something, I'm going to run to the right and to the right, I, I need this. And sometimes it'll be um, when I'm stressed out. And it won't be in, in an intelligent language, you know, like, in, <laughs> or I'll be hot because my, my students gave me a rough day in class and, and I'm, you know, I'm dealing with, you know, Ava, and I'm like, no, that rock won't do. <laughs> I need this thing, you know? And, and they have to like take that and they have to channel it and they're like, okay, you know? And I feel like that's, that, I feel like I understand that as the other side, you know? Um, I think being honest, you know, what you can and what you can't do. Um, I, th I think also um, understanding that, that our schedules are, are not like, like when I came here and I'm working on Labor Days because I teach, you know, and so it's like understanding the artist dilemma. Uh, so these kind of things are what, to me, which separates like really good curators from curators. Like I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm, you know, I can't answer the phone after eight or after six. And then all of a sudden it's just like, well, crap. You know, well, that's the only time I have to work. You know, so to me, that's 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 the dynamic is like. I mean, they have a vision, and you kind of sometimes fit into this vision, but but. Collaborate, you know, communication is, is essential, like going back and forth. And, and, um, and that's something that, that as, as an artist, we're not the best at. You know, I, I feel like uh, if I was a great communicator, I, I'd be like many of you and be able to write books. You know, I would love to write books, but I can't. So this is what I do. Um, and so that makes it difficult for a curator. I mean, I think it really does. Um, but ultimately, uh, there has to be negotiation. You know, and when that negotiation stops, that's when, when it gets really ugly. You know, because you don't know what um, they're doing, they don't know what you're doing. Um, and I think to, to every great curatorial ex you know, experience I have, um, there's this probably five that just, I mean, I, I, I barely knew who they were. You know, so it's, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of, I mean, there has to be um, care and understanding of what you're trying to do. And that you're, what you're trying to do sometimes might seem counterintuitive to, like when I'm explaining to the curator, you know, I'm, I'm doing a piece about space exploration, but it deals with blackness, um, you know, and it's just like, you know, I, I need someone to say, okay, you know, explain, talk more, explain more. Um, if a person ends the conversation, it's like, okay, you know, n no problem, then that, that's almost as bad as saying, oh, you know, well, that's a problem, you know, I, I don't like it. 
it's like there has to be that communication where um, you're talking and going back and forth. Uh, I think there's a lot more to it, but I think that's what's fresh in my mind right now. Yeah, it's great. Yes. It's good. <laughs> it's Ben Hur. Um, every Easter in my family watch Ben Hur. <laughs> and my dad's a Catholic deacon, you know, so it's like Charlton Heston, you know. It's, <laughs> I won't even go there, but um, you know, the Corcoran gave me an opportunity to create a piece, and, and I, I, I love the idea of, like, when, when I was a kid, when we were doing, like, a Herculean task, we'd say, well, let's bend her it. You know, let's really kind of, like, let's roll up our sleeves and let's bend her it. And, and I wanted to create a, a work um, that, that dealt with this, um, this energy of, 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 of this, this intense energy that, that was happening in a space where people were drinking drinking their wine and eating their cheese, but these guys were wearing themselves out. At first very systematically and at the end very sloppy. Mm -hmm. You know, the piece almost started like poetry. And it was beautiful. They're rowing, the machines are making this water noise, it's therapeutic. But then at the end it, it's competitive. It's like when when each when a per the, the the mission was that, that they were gonna row until they couldn't row anymore. And that happened at different places for everyone. The person up front is, is um, uh, Daryl Atwell, who by trade is an anesthesiologist. And uh, he was keeping the rhythm and the pace for everybody. His form was the best. He actually was a rower. Um, so he would give out sooner than a lot of the rest because his form was so good. And, and, and he had to make sure, I mean, it was like a lot of mental energy to make sure everybody was moving at the same pace. But then what would happen is uh, uh, shortly after you could you know predict it was like this guy or this guy would give out and there would be like the two 22 year olds that would be going and slugging away um, and the guy in front had an advantage over uh, or the guy in back had the advantage of the guy in front so the guy in back never really knew so it, it became like this this competitive um, piece uh, where you had you know a DJ and an African drummer. And the, 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 the cadence was, was difficult to keep and was sometimes working with the music, sometimes working against the music. Um, but it was just kind of like a, a, a really packed evening full of just like, you know, I mean, they're dressed uh, in the most civil way that, you know, that they couldn't and, and, and to, to work in, in this, you know, uh, for this, this piece. And they're, you know, they're wearing like these ties and press shirts. Um, and, and they're exerting themselves. So, I mean, it was like they were in work uniforms. And I think that was important. If they were, we tried one rehearsal where they're in tanks and it just didn't work, it became something else. It became like um, a, an exercise equipment, uh, you know, uh, piece. But with, with the, the formality, it, it kind of just reflected all of the, um, the dynamics of, of, of what work means, especially in, in the capital. So, it's been her. Um, another piece which, uh, you know, I, I hope you maybe, well, this will spark some interest for you to check out later, um, is Escape Artist. And, and this, this I feel is very relevant. Um, I've always been fascinated with Houdini. This idea of um, this, this artist who was trained to, to break out of any hole. I'm like, if, if, if this guy could train, like, you know, lesions of, you know, you know, people, how to... To, to, to break free from a hold, and, and what, what kind of power would that be? I mean, this guy hasn't, he's, he's, he's using it for show, but in my mind I'm thinking, um, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if he could train others how to break free of holds? Um, and so the last, I found out after research that the last person who was lynched in Maryland was lynched in a straitjacket, and that just gave me chills. And I found out where he was lynched, and he was lynched where, very close to where my parents live, um, on the eastern shore in Salisbury. And he was lynched in the court, uh, right in front of the courthouse, and that gave validity to the action. They dragged him right to the courthouse lawn, and, and um, they they lynched him, and, and um, then they, they dragged him in a vehicle um, by chain to the to the African American neighborhood, and they lit him on fire. Uh, the oddest part of this whole uh, in my research is finding out that this actually oh, the 80th year anniversary was like four months away from the time I started finding out about it. And I, you know, I called the city up and I said we should do something, and they're like, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so I created uh, this piece titled "The Escape Artist" that, that happened at, right in front of the the, the courthouse, and which. Uh, 
I was, I was bound in a straitjacket. Um, and it happened 80 years, the exact time that, that, he, um, that Matthew Williams, 1931, um, was killed. Um, so I learned how to break out of a straitjacket, which was just an incredible, um, uh, you know, a, a, a exhilarating experience of learning how, how, to, how to break free. And, and I guess it was, again, it's like intervening with history. And it was very strange because it, I, I kept pestering the city to, to allow me to do this performance piece. Um, because I, what I tell my students is, as much as you really love to go out and do guerrilla theater, um, it's, it's sometimes it's really awkward when you, you get started your piece and, and, and the cops come and say, you want to go to jail? So you, you almost have to work within the system. And uh, for this piece, I didn't get permission, but they sent me a very polite email saying, we're not going to give you permission, but we're not going to tell you you can't do it. So the police will be around and we'll tell them that you're doing the piece. And so um, at, at 8, um, 8 o'clock, um, December 3rd, uh, at, at you know the, the Wicomico County Courthouse, you know, I, I, there was a little bit of a different ending um, to being suspended. I think it's, it's that spectacle of seeing a person like hanging, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's theatrical. I mean, it's worse. I mean, the most uh, gruesome and grotesque kind of theater. Um, oops, I'm sorry. All uh, right. So, this is Escape Artist. Um, I will. Uh, if the video is is up on, on Vimeo. If you're interested in looking at that. And um, and I just want to quickly hit on Starved Ethiopia um, before I let you go. I, as I mentioned to you before. Uh, I, I didn't know about this pageant before David told me about it, and it just kind of, you know, it kind of sparked something. Um, it, it motivated me, it inspired me to, to, to learn more about Du Bois and, and his legacy. And the more I, I learned about it, the more I realized that this guy is just was was an artist. He really he was an artist. And I guess I hadn't really seen him at that because uh, because I'd been teaching um, the criteria of Negro art, and I, I was understanding a, just a certain facet. But um, Du Bois as an artist was new, and, and when I was reading through this, he would use this language that I thought just was was just so indicative of, of the artist's experience, um, and he was aware of that. I mean, I think um, you know, it's just like the, the, the theatricality of, of being able to put that many people on stage and have them do anything. It's going to be powerful, um, let alone singing "O Freedom," you know, 50 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he had his crew. Uh, I think that uh, what was fascinating about it is that he was dealing with props and costumes and dancings, lights and rehearsal. All this stuff is in Credo, by the way. But when you read through his scrapbook and, um, and, and you read all the different things that he had to be res responsible for, he was the maestro. He was allowing all of this stuff to happen and he was empowering people. People who weren't actors saying, you, you can do that. You, you will be good at this. I, I'm choosing you to, to be my veiled woman. Or he would, um, you know, Colonel Charles Young, who was, you know, back from foreign service with the highest ranking African American officer, he said, I want you to do my music. Because you, you've been to Africa, you know, you know what African music sounds like. I want you to, um, to do that. And, and so what we were doing, uh, David put me in touch with, because I was trying to find a sheet music that, that Colonel Charles Young had for this. And, and we went to the Ohio Historical Society, and they had no idea that Colonel Charles Young did the music for Star of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. They were like, let us, we're going to check. We'll get back to you. And then they checked, you know, through all of their files. They couldn't find it. But it's just the idea that there was this, there's this connectivity that people, people aren't even aware of. And I was fascinated with it. And, and dealing with personalities. Uh, I love hearing um, Du Bois like complain. <laughs> it just seems it makes him seem so human. He's like, and that dress rehearsal, my God, that night, you know, <laughs> it was a, a disaster. <laughs> As a matter of fact, even in the crisis, he even say that he's just like, and that dress rehearsal. That's all he put, you know. <laughs> it's like fill in the blanks, um, and just all of the different um, complexity involved. So when I um, created the piece that, that is in the, in the Fine Arts Center, I was really um, invested in the idea of like creating symbols and, and you know, w w when you have like a, a project or a challenge like this, uh, I think 
what was wonderful about it is, is that I could invent images. Um, I could invent a history that, that coincided with Du Bois' history, where he talked about the Black Rock and the sacrifices at the Black Rock and all of this mysticism, the, the, um, the pagan you know, thunder gods that, that the people, um, the savages, he titled it Africa, worship. Um, you know, and I, and I thought about the imagery, all the imagery in the pageant, and, and I thought, well, would it be great if we could bring it into the, um, the 21st century with neon? Um, so that's a piece um, that's, that's downstairs, or it's well, the building uh, across campus, Fine Arts Center. But, you know, what, what inspired uh, me for this is, uh, you know, I was taking um, information from what I could find, uh, like this is this is actually the star of Ethiopia. Um, this is the highest um, medal awarded to you know um, an Ethiopian uh, for for valor. I don't know if this uh, you know this this actually might um, not be uh, historically sensitive. I don't know if, if Du Bois was looking at this, but this is what we, this is where Jefferson Pinder comes into it. Uh, I was looking at this shape, and I thought it was just, wow, it was just kind of like this flat, grounded star. Um, and I was looking at um, the, the few extant of photographs, and I was, I, was, I was very curious why, you know, Du Bois seemed to, to gravitate toward light-skinned African-American women. Um, and I had, you know, and Horace yesterday gave a great lecture that, that just really kind of wrestled with that. You know, he was like, you know, he's in this position of power, but you look at who he was selecting and, and the hair. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know for sure, but I don't think that's their real hair. Um, and and I, I could be wrong, but I, I feel that that there, there's 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 other things um, going on in play. I mean, he has all these incredible and um, heavy influences. Um, one of which was was opera and his love for um, classical theater. And and I. I so I took this opportunity to, 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 to take a, a little bit of what um, Du Bois was, was, was wrestling with and trying to bring it into the 21st century. And, and as I mentioned, uh, this, is, this is Diamond. Um, this was my, my star of Ethiopia, my, or actually my veiled woman. Um, and I met her uh, at American Apparel. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I love this idea that Du Bois wanted to create a folk pageant about people. Um, about real people and, and, and the idea that uh, that he empowered them because he believed that they could be honest and truthful. And I believe that. I believe that he empowered these individuals because they, they haven't been trained to deceive. Um, but I also, you know, going back to my theater training, I thought, well, this, this woman also reminds me of the Deus Ex Machina. You know, that this, this, this figure who comes out of nowhere to present uh, to the savages of Africa, like what they need to move forward towards civilization, and using a, a, like a, a thinly veiled illusion of, of, of her moving through space was, was what I wanted to convey in the first eight minutes. So th these are stills from, from Overture in the Star of Ethiopia, the very beginning. Um, Diamond is moving through space. And then on the other uh, screen, you have the savages that are in this black box, and they're moving rhythmically together. Uh, the whole idea of using fire was, was, was new. Um, at first, I wanted to do it on my own, um, and then the costume designer, thank God, said, no, you need, you need to get professional. <laughs> He's like, this is completely synthetic. And, and, and you know, and I guess I hadn't really thought about that. Um, you would think I, I would have thought about it, but it, you know, I'm thinking about, like, what is it going to look like? Um, and so my costume designer encouraged me, or rightly so, to go out and to find like pyrotechnic people, and that's what we did. And uh, this is the culmination of the whole piece: is this presentation of, of this, this fire, and then on one hand, and iron in the other, taking incredible liberties with um, with Du Bois' uh, piece, but at the same time trying to boil it down to the essence of what I think was most important. Almost like a fractal, where you, know, you look, you look at one piece. And, and that gives you an understanding of the whole. That's that's what I would want this video to um, channel projection to portray. Okay. Um, so what's coming up next? Very quickly, I'm doing a project in Birmingham, Alabama, at um, the Lyric Theater, which was the first uh, theater in Al Birmingham, I think, in, in Alabama, in which blacks and whites could share the same space and watch a movie. 
the blacks had to sit up in the balcony, um, the whites, and an orchestra. That seems so weird to me. It's like, you know, that's against all your ideas of like, well, territorial space. It's like, you don't put the people that you're oppressing above you. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's this wonderful um, notes about how uh, African Americans up in the balcony would take popcorn and just would. Kind of <laughs> it's like, we're here. <laughs> this could be something else. <laughs> and, um, and, and they reopened this theater not too long ago, and, and I love the decay. I love the way it, it looked, um, or it looks right now. Wow. That, that I've never been able to do a performance in a place that looks like, um, like it, it was, was you know, like a 19, you know, 45, uh, you know, Germany, or it, it just looks like a, a bombed out space. But it was, it's representative of history, and of that decay. Um, but it's still standing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have um, a, a gospel choir at the top. Bluegrass singers at the bottom and Sacred Harps on the side, and we're going to be um, uh, interpreting like um, uh, standards of bluegrass and gospel, as well as uh, bringing in um, you know contemporary uh, masters like Kanye West <laughs> and, and David Byrne, and we're, we're creating a, an orchestral piece um, that that there's a, a interaction between the space, but but the audience will be on the stage. The audience is on the stage and they're looking out at this space, this decay, with um, the African Americans at the top, um, almost in, in choir robes being like uh, illuminated, and um, in period costumes, the white bluegrass singers at the bottom. I mean, it's the, the roots of, of these two genres of music is, is I mean, they're, they're so close and intertwined. It's almost ridiculous to, to, to separate them like that, but I feel like it, it speaks to the history. Um, and it speaks to the segregation of when, when these doors were open. Uh, there's just incredible narratives of, of African Americans having to come in the back door, going upstairs, and having to endure heat. And then there's these great narratives of the whites downstairs are like wondering what was upstairs. Mm -hmm. Was it like even though I'm I'm down here in this in the orchestra, I want to be up in the balcony because I I'm curious what that would, would be like. So that's that's happening in, in 2015, and uh, you know it was supposed to, to to happen next year, but. The EPA came in and said, um, no, more work has to be done in the theater before we can let people in. So, so that's been pushed back. Going to have popcorn? Huh? You're going to have popcorn? Um, perhaps. That's a good idea. <laughs> Listen, thank you. I know that went long. Thank you. Thank you.